Thanks to Brilliant for supporting this episode of Journey to the Microcosmos. Go to brilliant.org slash microcosmos to get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Some of the ciliates we find in the microcosmos have a sort of stoutness to them, like the declarative trumpet shape of the stentor or the oblong of the paramecium. But then you have this little weird fellow, which looks more like a twisty, slithering worm than a unicellular organism. This is a trachelocercid, and no, I do not know if I'm pronouncing that entirely correctly. It's a member of a class of ciliates called the Karyorelictia. We'll be showing you a few different trachelocercids today, though we can't specify their genera any further without using other experimental and microscopy techniques to see the smaller structures inside them. What they all have in common, though, is that they come from a place that we have not really visited yet on our journey through the microcosmos. They come from the beach. James, our master of microscopes, hired two PhD students to help him with a very important task. Every month, they bring him wet sand from the sea. Yeah, maybe some of us might get a subscription box filled with items related to our favorite hobby. James gets a monthly subscription of sand. And not just a little bit of sand here or there, he gets liters and liters of it that he then sifts through to find the microbes living inside. They're tucked away in the space between the grains of sand in pockets of water called interstitial water. And while for many of us a day at the beach might sound like a nice relaxing vacation, things are very different for the microbes who live there. Those little bits of interstitial water are a chaotic habitat. Just imagine your life at that scale, surrounded by sharp pieces of sand that, to you, probably would look more like giant boulders. But imagine that those rocks aren't just gigantic. They're moving in a constantly shifting landscape of sedimentary rubble, a cutting maze that's always changing as waves crash upon you. To survive, you can't just rely on adapting in the moment. You have to rely on countless generations of adaptation and evolution that have made it possible for you to respond and survive in the world around you. And for the karyorelictids, evolution has provided them with a number of tools to handle their tumultuous surroundings. Most karyorelictids live in the sands of marine environments. The notable exception are species of Loxodes, which live in freshwater. You've probably noticed that the Trachelocercid, while very worm-like, still has some of its own distinct shapes. If we were asked to compare it to another ciliate, we might look at the Lacrimaria olor, with its neck similarly extending and seeking and retracting. And like the Lacrimaria, the focus of the Karyorelictid's pursuit is probably food. They particularly enjoy a diet of other organisms, like bacteria, diatoms, and even rotifers. But the Karyorelictia doesn't just get to focus on hunting. In a world that is always changing, the ability for the Karyorelictia to twist and turn their elongated body helps them navigate their uncertain terrain and the narrow corridors that fill it. It also helps that some species can grow as large as five millimeters long. Karyorelictids can also use their cilia to attach themselves to grains of sand, giving themselves something to anchor onto if needed. But even then, a little bit of damage seems inevitable. I mean, this is sand and waves. That can hurt even when you're not a microbe. But the karyorelictids, they have a solid backup plan. Regeneration. It's a classic amongst microbes. You cut one piece and the organism grows that piece back, stitching itself anew. In the case of the karyorelictia, some species can regrow parts of their body within three or four hours. A lot of the traits we're describing in the karyolictids are traits shared by other ciliates that live in their own environments, but just refined through generation upon generation of interstitial life. 
But there is something that's a bit more unusual. Their nucleus doesn't divide. Like other ciliates, the karyorelictids have macronuclei and micronuclei, sometimes multiples of them. The macronuclei provide the genetic template for the cell's day-to-day -day life, while the micronuclei provides the genetic material that will be used and passed on during sexual reproduction. We talked about this process more in our recent conjugation episode, if you're curious how that works. And for most ciliates, when the organism divides, the macronucleus divides with it, ensuring that the new daughter cells each have their own macronucleus. But this is not the case for the karyorelictids. When they divide, their macronuclei don't. So the daughter cells use their micronuclei to make a whole new macronuclei. Karyorelictids are usually observed with multiple macronuclei, which is probably a way to ensure that there's at least some functional nucleus around while the organism is making a new one. It's not clear what this strange macronuclei behavior and its specificity to karyorelictids says about these organisms and their evolution. To some scientists, it means that maybe karyorelictids mirror some kind of ancestral ciliate state of nucleus non-division, while others consider it a potential evolutionary add-on that helps offset mutational damage in the organism. One of the challenges of being able to study their nuclei is the fact that most karyorelictid species have been difficult to cultivate in the lab. There's something a little frustrating but also very true to our attempts to understand biology that these organisms are so difficult to house in the well-fed comfort of a flask and yet thrive in the harsh reality that makes them so fascinating to begin with. Thank you for coming on this journey with us as we explore the unseen world that surrounds us. And thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring this episode. Brilliant has courses about science, engineering, computer science, and math. And while we may not be fighting to survive between giant grains of sand as waves of water crash down around us, we are constantly experiencing other forms of waves in our everyday life. Right now, for example, as you are listening to this video, sound waves are coming out of your speakers or headphones, and it may be hard to think of those waves in the same way that you think about waves on a sandy shore. But with courses like Waves and Light on Brilliant, you can learn what sound and water waves have in common. You'll learn basics like what a wave actually is, how they travel, and by the end, you'll have a greater understanding of how waves work in relation to everything from noise-canceling headphones to earthquakes. It's a wonderful way to develop a more robust understanding of how our universe works. The courses are designed to be hands-on with interactive quizzes and guided problems with explanations. If you're interested in learning more, you can get 20% off an annual premium subscription at brilliant.org slash microcosmos. The people you're seeing on the screen right now are our Patreon patrons. They are the people who make Journey to the Microcosmos possible, so thank you so much to all of them. If you want to learn how to become one of those people, you can go to patreon.com slash journey to micro. If you want to see more from our master of microscopes, James Weiss, you can check out Jam and Germs on Instagram. And if you want to see more from our YouTube channel, there's always a subscribe button somewhere nearby. <laughs>